everyone, welcome back to my channel for a brand new mystery with Molly. If you are new around here, if you've never seen my face before, then hi, my name is Molly. And I post true crime videos like this every single week. So if you think that's something that you might want to stick around for, then definitely subscribe. I would love to have you. My lava lamps are back. I don't know how long for because myself and my family are moving a few things around in our house. So for the next couple of months, I might be switching between having this background and my previous background. I hope you guys don't mind about that. I'm sure most of you won't care, but I just thought I would address it here. Otherwise, I know people would be like, why are you going from one background to another? But anyway, today we are going to be talking about the case of Stephen Stainer, and this is honestly an insane case. I can't remember when I came across this case, but I've known about it for a while and it's always been on my list to cover, so today's the day. And this video is technically part one of a two-part case, kind of, not really. I'll explain at the end of the video. But quickly before getting into it, I do just want to thank Spotlight Oral Care for sponsoring today's video. The brand Spotlight was created by two Irish dentists using clinically proven harm-free ingredients. They are vegan and cruelty-free as well as toxin-free, sulfate-free, um, they're sustainable and their packaging is 100% recyclable. I have been using Spotlight's products for a while now and they are perfect for me because I have quite sensitive teeth. I've always had sensitive teeth ever since I was a child so sometimes it's difficult to find dental products that really work for me. But I've recently been using Spotlight's Sonic Toothbrush and I can honestly say it's the best toothbrush I've ever used. The toothbrush has three speed settings which are clean, white and sensitive. Like I said I have quite sensitive teeth so the sensitive setting is really helpful because it doesn't aggravate my teeth but it still leaves them feeling super clean and the toothbrush actually has a two minute self timer and a 70 day battery life which is amazing because I am such a forgetful person and I always forget to charge things. I've also been using Spotlight's whitening toothpaste and their teeth whitening strips. To use the strips you just dry your teeth, you place the shorter one on your lower teeth and then the longer strip onto your top teeth. You leave them on for an hour. I do them in the evening when I'm like winding down and watching a film because I just completely forget that they're on. And then you take them off and brush your teeth afterwards to rinse away any residue gel. I've been using the strips for probably just over a week now and I can really see a difference already. I already feel like my teeth are looking a lot whiter. Using Spotlight's products has made my teeth and my mouth feel so fresh and healthy and I really recommend them to you guys. So join the Spotlight community and get 25% off your first order with them by clicking the link in the description box and using my discount code which is molly25. Once again that's the code molly25 for 25% off. Thank you so so much to Spotlight for sponsoring this video and supporting the channel. As you guys know us true crime creators get demonetized a lot so having the support of sponsors like Spotlight honestly means the world. But anyway now let's get into today's case. So this case takes place in the state of California in the US and this is Stephen Gregory Stainer. He was a seven-year-old boy born on the 18th of April 1965 to his parents Dalbert and Kay Stainer and they lived in Merced which is a town in California. Now the Stainer family lived on Betty Street which was in a very kind of middle-class normal neighborhood. They were a very normal middle-class family. Stephen was actually one of five siblings. He had three sisters and an older brother named Kerry. Carrie was the oldest sibling and at the time of this case taking place he was 11 years old so he was about four years older than Stephen and from what I can gather Stephen and Carrie were always very close growing up. Carrie was the older brother that I think any younger brother would want. He would play with Stephen, he had his brother's back, he just really cared for him a lot. And yeah there isn't too much information online about the family really. I think they were just a very normal family 
family living in California. Um, I know that Stephen's father worked as a mechanic. His mother Kay was said to be quite a distant woman, um, but in general they just seemed like a normal family living normal lives. However, life for the Stainer family would just completely change on the 4th of December 1972, and it would never be the same again. That day started just as any other normal day for seven-year-old Stephen Stainer. He had been to school, and when school finished that afternoon, he began walking home on his own. I believe most days he would walk home with his older brother, Kerry, but for some reason, on this day, he walked alone. And on this particular day, during his walk home along Highway 40, Stephen was approached by an older looking man, and this man was named Irvin Murphy. Murphy was holding some religious pamphlets and leaflets in his hand, and he walked up to seven-year-old Stephen, and he told him that he was collecting money for the local church. And he asked Stephen if he would be interested in donating anything to the local church, and Stephen replied saying that his mother, Kay, probably would. So Murphy basically said to Stephen, oh, can I come and ask your mother then? Can I come to your house and ask her? I'll give you a lift home. And at first, Stephen declined. He said no, because his house was literally only a couple of blocks away. But Murphy kept saying, oh no, I'll give you a lift home, I'll give you a lift home. And eventually, Stephen said, okay. And it was at this point when an old white Buick car pulled up alongside Irvin Murphy and seven-year-old Stephen. And Murphy told Stephen to jump in the car and he said that they would drive to his house and so Stephen did just that. He got into this car with two strangers. The man driving this car was 41 year old Kenneth Parnell and as he was driving Stephen noticed that he had actually passed the road that Stephen lived down and he pointed this out to Kenneth and he said you've just passed my house but Kenneth said something along the lines of oh don't worry I'll speak to your parents I'll ring them and ask if you can stay at my house tonight. So they continued driving and they actually drove out of the town of Merced and at some point on the journey Kenneth Parnell stops the car. He gets out of the car and he walks up to a payphone and he pretends that he is speaking to someone on this phone and after this phone call he walks back to the car where seven-year-old Stephen is and I imagine at this point Stephen was probably feeling really confused and scared because these two men had said they were going to drive him home but that clearly wasn't their plan. Anyway, Kenneth returned to the car and he basically said to Stephen, oh, I've just spoken to your parents on the phone and they've told me that they don't want you anymore. They don't want you as their son. He also says, so you're gonna come and live with me and you will be my son now instead. And of course, this is a seven-year-old boy. He doesn't understand this situation. He doesn't realise that he has been abducted. And so when this man is telling him this, telling him that his parents don't want him anymore, he believes it. But before I go any further with this case, let me just tell you a little bit more about Stephen's abductor, 41-year-old Kenneth Parnell. So he was born on September the 24th, 1931, in the city of Amarillo in Texas. He had two half-sisters and a half-brother. His father was a man named Cecil and his mother was named Mary. When Kenneth was just six years old, his father actually decided to walk out on the family he abandoned them and so Kenneth grew up without a father for most of his childhood and I believe following this the family moved to Bakersfield in California. Now Kenneth was a pretty badly behaved child he spent most of his teenage years in a juvenile hall which is like a youth detention center. He was also in and out of psychiatric hospitals when he was younger although I couldn't find anywhere what mental health issues he actually suffered with. Um, there isn't actually too much information online about Kenneth and his life that I could find anyway. 
but it's believed that he may have been molested when he was 13 years old at a rooming house in Bakersfield that Kenneth's mother owned. However, Kenneth himself has always denied that this happened. He says that he was never molested or sexually assaulted. But in the year 1951, so Kenneth would have been around 20 years old, he was actually arrested for kidnapping and sodomizing a young boy and also for using a fake sheriff's badge to pretend to be a police officer. I'm not sure why he was pretending to be a police officer. I don't know if that was linked to the sexual assault of that young boy but regardless he was arrested for these crimes and in 1952 he was sentenced to four years in prison. When Kenneth was interviewed about this crime years and years later he said that the reason he sexually assaulted the young boy was because at the time he had a wife, he was married to a woman named Patsy and she was pregnant and so he said that the reason he sexually assaulted this young boy was because he quote had to find a another outlet. Now speaking of marriage, Kenneth actually claims that in his life he married three different women. However, only two of these have been confirmed. There are only records of two marriages, one of which was Patsy, who was his first wife. They married in 1950, they had a daughter together and then they separated and got a divorce in 1957. He later went on to marry again, this time to a woman named Emma and she was about 10 years older than him and they also had a daughter together so Kenneth had a daughter from each of his marriages although I don't believe his daughters had much to do with him at all for obvious reasons but anyway during his four-year prison sentence for the sexual assault of that young boy Kenneth was also receiving treatment at a psychiatric hospital called the Norwalk State Hospital in California but during his time there Kenneth Parnell actually escaped Sources say that he apparently cut a lock from one of the windows in the hospital and he climbed out of it and he made a run for it but he was later found and taken back. About 10 years after the sexual assault case, Kenneth was sent back to prison again and this time for an armed robbery that he carried out in the state of Utah. And this time when he went to prison, his second wife Emma decided to leave him and get a divorce. And like I previously mentioned, he claimed that he got married for a third time. He said that he had a third wife and they got married in 1968, um, but no records of this marriage have ever been found. And then fast forward to 1972 when Parnell was 41 years old and he was working at a hotel resort in Yosemite National Park. I'm unsure how long he had been an employee there for but he worked as a night auditor so he would do overnight shifts working on the front desk and also doing some accounting. And another person who also worked at the same resort was Irvin Murphy, who if you remember was the man that helped Kenneth Parnell abduct seven-year-old Stephen Stainer. Now Irvin Murphy was a very simple-minded man, he wasn't intelligent, he was very naive and therefore he was easy to manipulate. So it's believed that Kenneth Parnell manipulated Irvin Murphy into helping him abduct a child that day. In fact, Kenneth actually told Murphy that he was an aspiring religious minister and that he wanted to take a child so that he could raise them in a quote, religious type deal whatever that means. And so Murphy agreed. I don't think he really understood what he was doing and I don't believe he knew what Kenneth Parnell really planned on doing to the young boy. But he agreed to help him and as we know on December the 4th 1972 the two men kidnapped seven-year-old Stephen Stainer as he was walking home from school along Highway 40 and they began driving out of the town of Merced. Meanwhile Stephen obviously hadn't arrived arrived home from school and his parents were immediately concerned because this wasn't like him at all and so they contacted the police department and reported Stephen as missing. A massive search began for the missing seven-year-old but to be honest it didn't amount to much at all because Stephen just disappeared off the street. There was no evidence, I don't believe there were any witnesses so there were no tips or leads or anything like that. Detectives didn't really have 
anything to investigate. They had no idea what happened to Stephen or where he was. And as you can imagine, the not knowing really took a toll on the Stainer family. Stephen's father, Dalbert, was absolutely heartbroken. People said that he really just became this broken man. Stephen's mother Kay was also heartbroken. She became a lot more distant and just cold really. From the looks of it she just kind of shut herself off from everyone. Dalbert and Kay continued to raise their children but when Stephen went missing they weren't as affectionate with their other children and I don't think they were overly affectionate parents beforehand anyway but now they were just a lot colder towards their children and the children really felt it. In fact their oldest child Carey said that he felt almost neglected by his parents when Stephen disappeared. Carey was around 11 years old at the time and his younger brother's disappearance really took a toll on him as well because as I mentioned earlier they were pretty close. Harry really cared for Stephen and so when he went missing he was just so sad and his friend said that he felt guilty that he wasn't with his brother at that time on that day. I've actually got a quote from Carrie here and he said I remember going out one night after Steve disappeared and wishing on a star that my brother would come back home and I did that almost every clear night from then on. I never did tell anybody about it but I remember wishing on a star that my little brother would come back home. But anyway back to Stephen and Kenneth. So once Kenneth had driven out of the town of Merced after he had kidnapped Stephen he continued driving until he reached a place in Mariposa County called Cathy's Valley which I believe is literally only about 25 miles from Merced where Stephen was from so they really didn't go that far. You would think Kenneth would have tried to go as far away as he possibly could after abducting a child but no. You see Kenneth had a cabin in Kathy's Valley and he took Stephen there and he told him pretty much the same thing that he told him before that his parents didn't want him anymore that they couldn't afford to feed him and keep him and so he had been given permission by a judge to adopt him as his son instead. A couple of online sources state that Parnell molested Stephen that first night and for the next week he kept this seven-year-old boy in his room and he just wasn't allowed out. And Stephen said to Kenneth several times in that first week that he just wanted to go home, he just wanted to go back to his parents but of course Kenneth wasn't going to let that happen and he decided that he needed to try and make Stephen forget his past. He needed to make Stephen forget his old life and forget his family and so to do this he would constantly give Stephen cough syrup in the hopes that this would sedate him and he would become confused and forgetful. Essentially he wanted to erase Stephen's memory. Eventually Kenneth began telling Stephen that his name was actually Dennis Parnell and no longer Stephen Stainer and from this point on this little boy had a new identity. He was now Dennis Parnell, son of Kenneth Parnell. Although he did allow Stephen to keep his middle name so his name was Stephen Gregory Stainer so his new name was Dennis Gregory Parnell. Less than two weeks after Kenneth kidnapped Stephen he raped him for the first time and this was his motive for all of this. He wanted a young boy that he could sexually assault and brainwash and I cannot imagine the hell that Stephen went through. This seven-year-old boy was taken from his family, told they just didn't want him anymore and then his abductor who claimed to be his new father was sexually assaulting him. The two stayed in the cabin in Caffey's Valley for a couple of weeks but then Kenneth decided to move around California. They were never in one place for very long. He would constantly move them from one place to another. Kenneth would go from job to job and they would stay in like old trailers. Sometimes they would stay in hotels. I think that Kenneth never wanted them to stay in the same place for long at the very beginning because 
he feared that someone would recognise Dennis as actually being Stephen Stainer because, of course, there was a huge investigation for this missing boy. And honestly, it's a mystery to me how no one ever did recognise him. Obviously, Kenneth would hide him away most of the time, but they still stayed in California and he would be allowed out occasionally. So... The fact that no one recognised him is baffling. As time went on, Kenneth continued pretending to be Stephen's father and he would also continue to sexually abuse his son. Eventually, Kenneth enrolled Stephen in a school under the name Dennis Parnell and apparently this school didn't try to gather Stephen's or Dennis's um, previous school records, like records of which schools he had been to before, which if the school had done that they would have realized that there were no records of Dennis Parnell because Dennis Parnell didn't actually exist this wasn't this young boy's real name yeah that was their life I think Stephen eventually adjusted to his new life with Kenneth Kenneth actually gave him a dog at one point um it was a little terrier named Queenie who Stephen absolutely loved and I think Kenneth believed he had successfully brainwashed Stephen into forgetting his past life. It seemed as though this man had gotten away with it. About four years after Stephen was abducted in 1976, Kenneth moved the two to Conchi, which is a small town in Mendocino County in California. And here they lived in a trailer in a very quiet, secluded area. It would have been the perfect place for them to hide because there really wasn't much around at all. Stephen began attending Mendocino High School, which was actually about 30 minutes away from the trailer that he lived in with Parnell so he had to get a bus to school every single day. By this point Stephen had entered his teenage years and he was pretty popular in high school. He had a lot of friends, he had a girlfriend, um, he was described as just having a really great personality. Everyone wanted to be around Dennis Parnell because he just seemed like such a happy guy, when in reality they had no idea about the kind of abuse he was suffering at home. They had no idea what was going on behind the scenes and they had no idea that he was abducted years ago and that Dennis Parnell wasn't his real name. But Stephen was really into like sports and athletics in high school and his classmates just thought he was a really cool guy because he seemed to have a lot of freedom. His father, Kenneth Parnell, seemed to let Stephen do pretty much whatever he wanted. He was allowed to smoke and drink at a really young age when the other students weren't. Um, he was allowed to go out whenever he wanted most of the time and Kenneth always trusted him to come back. Kenneth didn't really care at this point. As long as Stephen always came back, he didn't care if he went out and smoked and drank alcohol and did drugs, even though he was still very young at this point. In the year 1979, when Stephen was 14 years old, he and Kenneth moved again, this time to Manchester, which is another place in Mendocino County. So they didn't move too far. I think it was about 40 miles from where they lived in Compche. And in Manchester, they lived in a cabin. And this cabin, again, was in a very quiet secluded area there weren't many people around however as Stephen began to get older as he was growing and going through puberty his abductor Kenneth really started losing interest in him losing his sexual interest in him Kenneth Parnell was a paedophile he was attracted to younger boys like boys around the same age that Stephen was when he was abducted and he was bored of sexually assaulting Stephen because he wasn't satisfying him anymore. He wasn't attracted to him anymore because he was older now. And also I feel like Kenneth probably realised that as Stephen was getting older, he was obviously getting a lot bigger, so soon he wouldn't be able to overpower him. He wouldn't be able to control him and Parnell wanted someone that he could control and so he decided that it was time that he started looking for another young child that he could kidnap and 
sexually assault and abuse and raise as his son. But just like with Stephen's abduction all those years earlier, Kenneth wanted an accomplice. He wanted someone to help him abduct another child. His first accomplice was a woman named Barbara Mathias. Mathis? I'm probably not pronouncing that right. I literally say that in every single video. There's always something I can't pronounce. According to a couple of sources online, Barbara lived with Parnell and his son Stephen in 1975 when Stephen was around nine years old and she claims to have had no idea that Stephen wasn't actually Parnell's son. I believe that Barbara and Kenneth had some sort of romantic relationship, sexual relationship. Some sources claim that she was his mistress um, but whatever the nature of their relationship for the duration of her stay with Stephen and Kenneth she would actually join Kenneth when he was sexually abusing Stephen so she would sexually assault Stephen as well. So not only was Stephen being abused by the man who claimed to be his father, he was also now being abused by this woman Barbara and eventually she agreed to help Kenneth abduct another child which I mean to me that makes it seem like she did know that Stephen was abducted um, but anyway, she agreed to help him abduct another child and on one occasion she tried to convince a young boy to get into Kenneth's car but thankfully this failed and the boy I think just refused. Barbara eventually stopped living with Kenneth and Stephen. I think she lived with them for a total of 18 months but then she moved out for whatever reason. I don't really know what happened. I don't know if her and Kenneth like split up. But anyway back to Kenneth's accomplice. So like I said Stephen was getting older which meant that Kenneth was losing his sexual interest in him and he wanted to abduct another young boy and Kenneth soon realised that he could make Stephen help him do this. He could make Stephen help him kidnap another young boy. And so the two, Kenneth and Stephen, would go out, they would drive around in Kenneth's vehicle and they would try to abduct a child. But these attempts were unsuccessful every time because Stephen would sabotage them. He would try his hardest to make sure Kenneth failed to abduct another child. He didn't want Kenneth to kidnap another kid because he knew the kind of hell they would be put through, the kind of abuse they would have to endure. And so every single time he would sabotage these abductions. But Kenneth didn't know that. He just thought that Stephen was a really bad accomplice and that he wasn't very good at crime. He had no idea that he was actually trying to sabotage these abductions. And so eventually Kenneth decided to find a new accomplice and soon he did find one. It was a young high school boy named Randall Sean Pullman and he was actually one of Stephen's friends from school. Kenneth basically said to Sean, I will pay you in drugs and money if you help me kidnap a child and Sean agreed. One source that I read did say that Sean actually didn't want to go through with it in the end and that he backed out but Kenneth actually threatened him and made him do it. It was the 14th of February 1980 and that day Randall Sean Pullman and Kenneth Parnell drove to Ukiah in California and that was where they were going to try and steal a child. But of course Kenneth wasn't going to do it himself. He was very clever with that actually. He would always get someone else to physically abduct the child whilst he sat in his vehicle ready to drive away. That way if there were any witnesses they wouldn't see Kenneth trying to abduct the child, they would see Randall and like in Stephen's abduction they would see Irvin Murphy. Anyway the two got to Ukiah and Kenneth pretty much told Sean to just walk up and down the street and wait for a young boy to come along. Eventually Sean spots a five-year-old little boy named Timothy White and he was playing outside his parents home at the time. Now I believe Sean just walked up to Timothy and asked him to come to Kenneth's car with him but Timothy obviously didn't know this man, he didn't know this car and so he said no and he actually tried to 
go back into his house. But as he did, Sean grabbed this five-year-old boy and began pulling him towards Kenneth's car. And Timothy was terrified, obviously. He was crying and screaming and really trying to get out of Sean's grip, but he couldn't. And soon enough, he was inside of Kenneth Parnell's car and they were on their way back to his cabin where he lived with Stephen Stainer, who, remember, was 14 years old at this point. This was seven years after Stephen's abduction. Just like Kenneth had done with Stephen seven years earlier, he began trying to brainwash Timothy. He tried to make him forget his old life and his real family, and he began calling him Tommy instead. Timothy White was now Tommy Parnell, and he was told that Kenneth was his new father and that Stephen, or Dennis Parnell, was his older brother. Kenneth also dyed Timmy's hair. Timmy naturally had quite light blonde hair, and so Parnell decided to dye it a dark brown as a disguise. Soon it had been two weeks since Timmy's abduction, and he was really struggling. As you can imagine, he was so confused and he just wanted to go home to his real mum and dad. And 14 year old Stephen felt so sad for this little boy. Over those two weeks he had become really close to Timmy and he really looked after him and he was terrified for him because obviously Stephen had been abused by Kenneth Parnell for years and years by this point and he just knew that the same would happen to Timmy. He couldn't let that happen. He could didn't let this five-year-old boy suffer in the same way that he had done for seven years and so he decided that he was going to try and take Timothy White back home to his real family. So about 16 days after Timmy was taken on March the 1st 1980 Stephen decided that that night was the night he was going to try and return Timmy to his home. That night Kenneth Parnell went to work. I think he had a security job or something like that at the time and when he left Stephen and Timmy left the cabin and they began hitchhiking to Ukiah where Timmy lived. They didn't walk the whole way there at some point a truck driver stopped and offered them a lift to Ukiah and when they got there they were walking around and they were trying to find Timmy's house. However it was so dark outside and Timmy obviously was only a five-year-old boy and he couldn't remember where he lived and of course Stephen didn't know where he lived either. So Stephen decided the best thing to do would just be to take Timmy to the nearest police station and hopefully the officers would be able to find his address and then take him home and then Stephen just intended to go back to the cabin, go back to Kenneth Parnell on his own afterwards. So Stephen takes Timothy into this police station and he sits down with the officers and he begins to tell them what happened. And then all of a sudden he says something to the police officers, he says a line to the police officers that is the most famous part of this whole case. Does that make sense? A line that became the title of a book about this case, a line of a TV series about this case, or maybe it was a movie, but it's probably the most famous thing about this whole case. He turns to the police officers and he says, quote, I know my first name is Stephen. This 14 year old boy who had been raised for the last seven years being told his name was Dennis Parnell, had remembered that his real name was actually Stephen Stainer. So the following day, Kenneth Parnell was arrested for the abductions of both Stephen and Timothy, and the police began looking into his past. And that's when they found that he had previously been convicted for the sexual assault of that young boy in 1951. And I'm just going to run through now Kenneth's trial and his sentence before we talk about Stephen's life after his abduction and his reunion with his family. So Kenneth Parnell was charged with the kidnapping of both boys however he was not charged with sexually assaulting Stephen and I believe that was because initially Stephen told the police that Kenneth didn't 
um, sexually assault or abuse him and so they didn't have sufficient evidence to charge him with that. We do know now that he was in fact sexually assaulted by Kenneth multiple times however at the time detectives didn't have enough evidence to charge him with that and so they could only charge him with kidnapping the boys. So in 1981 he was convicted of both kidnappings and he was sentenced to seven years in prison however unbelievably he was released after just five years. He served just five years for abducting and keeping a child for seven years and then he abducted another child which I literally cannot understand. This man was a clear danger to children and yet they just let him walk free after serving just five years. And to no surprise, he did actually try to abduct a child again after this. In 2003, when Parnell was in his early 70s, he was living in the city of Berkeley in San Francisco. And he had a lot of health conditions that meant he needed pretty much 24 hour nursing care. His nurse or caregiver was a woman named Diane Stevens and he began trying to persuade her to kidnap or purchase a child for him just like he had done years before with Irvin Murphy and Sean Pullman and Barbara. Diane says that it was clear from some of the things that he said that he wanted a young child for sexual intentions. I have read on one source what he reportedly said to her but I'm not going to repeat it because it's disgusting and it makes me feel sick. And Diane was fully aware of Kenneth's past. She knew that he had abducted Stephen Dana and Timothy White years and years prior and so she told the police what he had said. The police set up an operation to try and catch Kenneth out and they did. They caught him I believe trying to pay for a young boy and so he was arrested. He was convicted in February of 2004 for attempting to purchase a child and under California's free strikes law was sentenced to 25 years to life in prison. And Kenneth Parnell actually died from natural causes in January of 2008 when he was 76 years old. Kenneth's accomplice in Stephen's abduction, Urban Murphy, was given a sentence of five years in prison for his part in Stephen's kidnapping, although he was actually let out on parole after just two years. So he served two years in prison for his part in the abduction. Kenneth Parnell's girlfriend or mistress, whatever, Barbara, was never actually charged with anything, even though it's believed she tried to help Parnell kidnap another child on a few occasions. But yeah, she was never charged with anything. I'm guessing there wasn't enough evidence to charge her, um, but she actually helped authorities in Parnell's trial. I think she might have given evidence against him. Randall Sean Paulman, who was that teenager that helped Parnell now abduct Timothy White was sentenced to a term in a juvenile work camp for his part in Timothy's kidnapping. So that's it for the convictions and the sentencings. Um, now let's go back to Stephen being reunited with his family and what his life was like when he came home. So after the police realised who Dennis Parnell really was, Stephen Stainer, the 14 year old was finally reunited with his family after seven years of being missing. Five year old Timothy White was also reunited with his family and this whole story was absolutely huge as you can imagine. People had pretty much given up hope years before that Stephen would ever be found. Everyone thought he was dead and now here he was. And everyone just thought he was such a hero, which he was. He had saved this five-year-old boy from suffering the same fate he did. He was so brave. He returned to Merced, his hometown. His family were so overjoyed and the media went crazy over Stephen Stainer's story. He was on every newspaper, every magazine. He literally became this 
celebrity in California and not long after he was reunited with his family, Stephen went on Good Morning America with his parents Dalbert and Kay Stainer. I will try and put a couple of clips of his interview in now. I'm not sure if I will be able to for copyright reasons but I will try. If I can't I will leave the interview linked in the description box. But in the interview he basically talks about the day that he was abducted and his parents talk about how hard it was for them over the years not knowing what happened to their son. Steven Stainer disappeared on his way home from school in Merced, California. He was seven years old. Two weeks ago, he walked into a police station in Ukiah, California with a younger child who had been kidnapped recently. Apparently, uh, Stephen had been kidnapped and told that he had been adopted. Uh, Stephen had been calling his abductor dad for some time. For seven years, his parents, Kay and Delbert Stainer, never gave up hope that he was alive. And this morning, uh, they have uh, these three members of the Stainer family joined us. And what happened that afternoon? Do you remember when you were walking home from school? Uh, yes, um, I was walking home from school and I was stopped by a man along the street just a few blocks from my house and he uh, asked me if I wanted to, me or my, my mother wanted to donate something to a church and I had told him that uh, my mother would probably want to and so he offered me a ride home. The car pulled up and I got in and they they passed the road that I was that I lived on and I had told them that that was the road I lived on they said that we'll just uh, call your parents see if you can stay the night you called him I'm, I've been told that you called him dad how long before you started calling him dad do you have any idea when that started um, that started about a week after my abduction. What were your thoughts during the seven years about your parents? Did you think about them? And if so, what, what went through your mind? Um, through the seven years, I don't remember what went through my mind, but I thought of my parents very often. Mr. Stainer, did you have any doubts during those seven years that you'd see your Stephen again? Well, I had a lot of hope up to two years ago. Uh, there was a few things that came up that I kind of I kind of lost a little my hope and faith in it, and, but uh, I was wrong. <laughs> I never did lose my hope that I would find Steve. I didn't get into all the things that uh, Dell did. I was um, oblivious to all that kind of stuff. I just went merrily on my way believing that Stephen would be home one day. Now, on the surface, this all appeared to be the perfect reunion for the Stainer family. They were seen like hugging, they had uh, press conferences outside of their house where the family was really emotional and stuff like that. But in reality, it wasn't much like that at all for the Stainers. I think it was for a while. I think Stephen was obviously so happy to be home and his family was so happy to have him home. But Stephen struggled. He found it really difficult to adjust to life living at home. Obviously he had gone from being an only child with Kenneth Parnell who to be honest gave him quite a lot of freedom like I mentioned earlier. Stephen was allowed out whenever he wanted, he was allowed to smoke and drink and do drugs because Kenneth didn't really care. Whereas with the Stainers he wasn't allowed to do any of that. There were all these rules that he now had to live by. It was a huge change for him and on top of that he now had to adjust to life with four siblings. He had three sisters and obviously Kerry, his older brother. And I believe when Stephen returned home, he had to share a room with Kerry, which was also difficult because they didn't seem to get along very well now. Um, when Stephen returned home, Kerry was around 18 years old and he didn't actually seem too happy about the fact that his brother was home. High school was also really hard for Stephen. Obviously when he returned home to Merced he went to a new high school there and he had 
a really hard time and it honestly breaks my heart but Stephen was literally bullied in school and made fun of when it came to light that Stephen was in fact sexually assaulted and abused by his abductor Kenneth Parnell. The kids at his school were horrible to Stephen. They teased him and they said that he was gay because he had been sexually assaulted by another man and so he just dropped out of school. It got so bad that he just dropped out. I honestly cannot imagine how hard it must have been for him to have gone through what he went through and then to come home and be bullied because he was sexually assaulted. Oh my god, it's making me so upset. It literally makes me so upset and angry and I hope that the kids who bullied him faced punishment but I'm guessing they didn't, which is why he just decided to drop out of school. And the bullying and teasing actually got so bad that Stephen said that sometimes he just wished he never came home. Sometimes he wished he just stayed with his abductor. And on top of all of this, around the same time, he had been going to court and had to face Kenneth Parnell at his trial. Now, when Stephen returned home, people suggested to his parents, Kay and Dalbert, that he should see a therapist, that he should have some counselling because of everything that he had gone through. But his parents just refused to get him any help. They said that he didn't need it. They said that he didn't need counselling. Eventually, Stephen was actually kicked out of the house by his father, Dalbert. Um, I don't know the exact reason behind this. I don't know why he kicked him out. I think, in general, they just didn't have a good relationship. Like I mentioned before, Stephen struggled to follow the rules that his parents had set for him when he returned and his parents, it seemed, didn't really want to acknowledge what he had gone through and that he needed help and so I think in return Stephen kind of lashed out and he wouldn't follow the rules and so his father kicked him out. He kicked out the son. He had been missing for seven years. And after this, Stephen just seemed pretty lost for years. He had made some money from what had happened to him. I actually read somewhere that Timothy White's parents gave him like a couple thousand dollars for his bravery and for returning their son. Stephen also did a couple of interviews here and there about his story and they paid him for it. Um, he actually played a police officer in the TV series that was made about his story, that was based on his story. So he made a little bit of money from that. He was, I think, going from job to job and he would pretty much just spend his money on drugs and alcohol. Like I said, he just seemed quite lost for a while. However, when Stephen entered his early 20s, he did manage to turn his life around and he met a woman named Jodie Edmondson. And the two, Jodie and Stephen, eventually fell in love and they got married and they had two children together. And it seemed as though after all these years, Stephen Stainer was finally happy and content with his life. He had his own beautiful little family. He had a job as a pizza delivery driver. He was working a lot with child abduction groups and he was giving talks to children about how they can stay safe. His life was just back on track. But sadly, that would all come to to an end on the 16th of September 1969 when Stephen Stainer suddenly died. He was on his way home from work driving a motorcycle and he wasn't wearing a helmet. And at some point, a car actually pulled out in front of him, hit Stephen's motorcycle, and I believe the motorcycle actually flipped, and Stephen Stainer passed away from his injuries at just 24 years old. It's just absolutely heartbreaking. This man had gone through such hell in his short life, and then when his life finally seems to be going well again, he dies. Stephen's wife was absolutely furious as well because the accident was a hit and run so the driver of the car that had collided with Stephen just drove off after he hit Stephen and left him to 
die in the street and his punishment was I think literally like three months in prison and a $100 fine. More than 500 people attended Stephen Stainer's funeral including Timothy White who by this point was around 14-15 years old and he was actually a pallbearer at Stephen's funeral. Timothy actually went on to become a deputy sheriff as an adult um, and similar to Stephen he also gave talks to young children about the dangers of child abduction. In the year 2004 when Kenneth Parnell was on trial again for attempting to purchase a child, Timothy White actually testified against him in court and so did Randall Sean Poorman, who if you remember was the teenager that helped Kenneth Parnell abduct Timothy. Obviously by this time he wasn't a teenager, he was a fully grown adult and so was Timothy White. And Timothy actually spoke to Sean Pullman after this testimony and he actually forgave him for helping Parnell. In fact, the two actually hugged. Timothy White also died very suddenly in April of 2010 from a pulmonary embolism, which is a blockage of an artery in the lungs. And he was just 35 years old when he died. So just like Stephen, incredibly young. Shortly after Timothy White's death, a statue of him and Stephen Stainer was dedicated to the both of them in Applegate Park in Merced. And that is the end of of this case, kind of. That's where I'm going to end this video. Um, at the start of this video I said that this was kind of going to be a two-parter because there is a huge plot twist in this case and that is that Stephen's older brother, Carrie Stainer, actually went on to become a serial killer known as the Yosemite Park Killer. So part two of this case is going to be about Carrie Stainer. I did think about just adding it onto the end of this video, however, I decided to just make a separate video on the Yosemite Park Killer because otherwise this video would be so, so long. And also, even though Carrie is obviously linked to Stephen because he's his older brother, his murders are a completely separate case, so I wanted to make a completely separate video for it. So yeah, my next video will be on the serial killer, Carrie Stainer. Um, I'm not sure when it will be out just yet, hopefully not long after this one, but um, I will keep you guys updated on my Twitter and my Instagram, so make sure you are following them. But yeah, that is it for this video. As usual, please do let me know your thoughts and opinions on it in the comments. Um, I honestly think it's one of the most insane cases I've ever covered. Before I go, I do just want to thank Spotlight Oral Care for sponsoring today's video. Remember to use the link in the description box and my discount code MOLLY25 for 25% off your first order with them. I highly recommend their products. I also just want to give a special shout out to the members of my Patreon page. Thank you so, so, so much for your support, guys. Um, if anyone else wants to become a member of our little Patreon family, then the link is always in the description box of my videos. Please do give this video a thumbs up and also subscribe if you haven't already and I will see you again next time for a serial killer case. Bye guys!